Hi, my name is Bob Kringer and I'm a volunteer with the Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project. Okay, so it's the 30th of December 2020 and I was writing some comments on a forum today about linear accelerators and talking about the work of Takaaki Matsumoto, the Japanese nuclear researcher from Hokkaido University, who sadly departed in 2013. However, I was talking about the importance of his work and how more people should be paying attention. And a researcher called Camilla Urbina in South America happened to find a paper which combined Linux and Takaaki Matsumoto. And he shared it with me a few hours ago and I was extremely interested and excited because it's such a beautiful two pages and I will run through it now and what I will do is on my newsletter at remoteview.icu I will also put some of the references that I'm referring to in this overview of this paper. Anyway, so the paper is titled Acceleration Methods of Itonic Clusters and this is written by Takaaki Matsumoto, Department of Nuclear Engineering, Hokkaido University. The abstract. A new state of atomic clusters can be easily generated by electric discharges. Since electronuclear reactions, ENRs, could occur in the cluster, new physics could be expected with an accelerated beam of clusters. Here, two acceleration methods of the clusters will be proposed by using LINAC. Introduction. I'm going to read the whole thing because it is so important. I encourage you to go and read it again and internalize it. I will give a link to the papers that Camillo has collected together. So, introduction. In the 20th century, Linux have been amazingly progressed. Their performance was described by two basic parameters of acceleration, energy and a current of particles. A further development in the direction will somewhat continue in future. But, considering limits of its technology and cost, a new direction would be developed, LINAC of accelerating atomic clusters. Then, the performance of LINAC will be described by three basic parameters. The number of atoms involved in a cluster should be newly added to the two parameters. Their methods of bonding cluster atoms would be one of the most critical problems. Okay, so not the clearest phrase there. I want to put into context that this paper was released at the conference of the 25th Linear Accelerator Meeting in Japan, 12th to the 14th of 2000. Recently, the author discovered a new state of clusters of mainly hydrogen atoms during the study of so-called cold fusion. The clusters, called itonic clusters, and that is the name that he gave to them, could exist for a moment as stable bodies and run around in air or underwater. Their curious behaviour very resembled to ball lightning, BL, which was often observed in the natural environment. Itonic clusters were alternatively called micro-ball lightning. Since itonic clusters were negatively charged, they would be effectively accelerated to a high energy by LINAC in order to open new physics in the future. Okay, so... It was Ed Lewis that gave him the idea that this plasmoid, as it was called by the 1949 to 1950-60s researcher that did a lot of work on this, Winston Bostick, he called them plasmoid, which he initiated these iron-electron pairs and then fired these beams in across a magnet and they clustered and it formed these things that he termed plasmoids. And a guy called Ed Lewis then had discussions with Takaaki Matsumoto in the 1990s and therefore the idea that this was related to ball lightning was born in terms of Takaaki's understanding. But anyway, so I am very much behind the fact that it is the technological equivalent of natural ball lightning. I have to say that in 2001, in a letter to the editor in Fusion Technology, that's a journal of the American Nuclear Society, Takaaki Matsumoto conceded that probably the itonic clusters were actually the same as those exotic vacuum objects, or EVOs, that was the final name that Ken Shoulders gave following his research into the discoveries of what is possible with this by John Hutchison. And so there's a long history, and I've been talking about this over the last three years, 
but for the purposes of this paper, we'll continue reading it as itonic clusters. So at the bottom here, it says, what is itonic cluster? And so he goes on. During electrolysis or discharge, many electrons could be charged on atomic clusters, which were formed in or on metal electrodes. Then a portion of the electrons should have been scattered out, but the remained electrons could have been interconnected each other and formed a network. Okay, so it's a bit difficult, the English, but basically he's saying that the electrons um, should have gone and, and uh, apart from each other, the Coulombic repulsion, but uh, actually they connected to each other and formed like a, a mesh-like network. And in this book here that was given to me by Sho, uh, and it's, it's the Japanese version of uh, Takaaki Matsumoto's uh, book, he actually has... Uh, a mesh, a look at these mesh. So you can see it's like uh, you've got some rings that have joined up into kind of like a buckyball here with, with typically six and, 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 and five sided uh, sections. And we observed these structures in the Amasa gas uh, vibrator plates when I looked at those under the uh, Dino Light microscope in 2019. Uh, so th there, we, there we go. So that's the kind of itonic cluster, as it were. And if you go on, the network of those electrons strongly compressed the atomic cluster inwards to make it shrink. In the cluster, nuclear reactions could take place called electronuclear reactions. No acceleration process of particles was needed to induce electronuclear reactions, unlike conventional nuclear reactions of charged particles since they could occur in the strongly coupled multi-body system. Electronuclear reactions were completely different from conventional ones. Uh, there are several kinds of electronuclear reactions which were found so far as follows. A new fusion reaction of producing helium-4 from two deuterons, but with no gamma rays. Sequential captures of protons, electrons, to contribute to nuclear uh, transmutation. So if you've got a capture of uh, an electron or uh, uh, protons into uh, the material in the middle, you then get production of heavier elements. And that's electronuclear uh, transmutation. And multi-body fission reactions, generation of little neutron star, and electronucleon collapse, ENC, and electronuclear regeneration. I can categorically say that I shared evidence of every type of these reactions in the systems that I have looked at since 2017 before I came across the work of Takaaki Matsumoto after my visit in 2018 to Sochi. So you will see that if you look at this book, all the work of Takaaki Matsumoto, and you refer it back to the videos and images that I've shared over the last few years, you will see that some very strong correlation in the observations. Okay. So among electronuclear reactions and electronuclear collapse, they were the most significant nuclear reaction. Many beautiful pictures were clearly indicated in electronuclear collapse. Uh, were taken in previous experiments. Now, in this book, uh, it has basically most of the papers that are shared in the, the library that we get linked to. So th this is kind of like a, uh, a kind of black hole type uh, event. It's like the, the discharge from it or a white hole. And this particular structure is an, almost a dead ringer for what I call the spidey, which is an ejection from a point on the aluminium of John Hutchison and you can see that it's carbon that comes out of this like a diamond structure and I think magnesium on the sort of fibers which is basically two carbon atoms fused together and so it's like an ejection so we have this in extreme fidelity whereas this is on some other material but you can go and see that in his papers and then he has some other examples where he's got these electron nuclear collapse and then subsequent explosions, and the, he calls them stars. He's got many examples, and we observed these from Echo Fuel in 2017. These kind of starred uh, structures, and sometimes with these uh, ring products coming out of the imploded, exploded structure. And then these kind of structures, which were put into a paper in September 1992. 
and then submitted to Fusion Technology and published in early 1993. So this is a frost of hydrogen. So this is ultra-dense hydrogen in a kind of frozen crystalline state here and here. And these are droplets. And uh, we observe these kind of materials coming out of the ultrasonically processed echo fuel in 2017 and later I think that year researcher Me356 observed the same things coming out of his uh, processed I think it was nickel fuel. We have basically observed pretty much every single feature these ring spots here uh, we observed many times in various experiments and I've shown those and hexagonal structures that he observed we have also observed and these kind of structures as well we have observed and shared many, many images of those kind of things. So I would recommend you definitely go and look at the uh, English versions of the papers, which I will give a link to in the blog. OK, so it was made clear by underwater spark discharge experiments that there are two types of itonic clusters, ball and ring. Specifically, this is a sphere and a toroid, and this is basically what I came to the conclusion of a couple of years ago that th these are the two forms that it essentially takes. The ball cluster with a strong compression could induce electronuclear collapse and electronuclear regeneration. On the other hand the ring cluster decayed to an almost hexagonal plate during which electronuclear transmutations can occur as well. Now I have shared many videos that I will also give a link to of observations that I have made in various systems where you get these hexagonal and also pentagonal shapes forming from these ring clusters decaying. And I've spoken about the electronuclear collapse and that produces the star, the kind of nova that you get out of it. And the electronuclear regeneration, this is where whatever nucleons you put in, so if you can put in some uranium or, or some californium, uh, it then collapses in. And what you tend to get out is some sort of resonant combination balance. And it tends to be, in my experience, uh, a lot of carbon. This is also true of Takaaki Matsumoto. And you get alpha particles out. Uh, this was observed by S.V. Adamenko. Uh, the Proton 21 labs in Ukraine, just outside of Kiev. And you get a lot of calcium, which is deck alpha. So you typically also get a lot of oxygen, which is quad alpha. So you get a lot of these alpha conjugate nuclei being generated. And this is because I believe that the smallest thing that can be compressed down to, it's not quite a black hole. It is basically a bosonic core, which is just alpha particles overlaid onto each other over and over again to the nth degree. And when this breaks up, it breaks up into quanta of the alpha particles. OK, so generation of itonic clusters, a method of underwater spark discharge was one of the most effective methods for generating itonic clusters. The details of underwater spark discharge were examined by this author. A very high current should have been required to induce electronuclear reactions with electrodes of usual dimensions, but very easy and cheap device of underwater spark discharge was made possible by using thin wire electrodes. During underwater spark discharge, thin wire electrodes such as cadmium and nickel were immersed in electrolyte solution such as potassium carbonate. Potassium is, in my understanding, and I will go into this in specific detail, it's very good at creating the necessary conditions for these reactions. And I came to the conclusion that because it is the second most unstable primordial isotope after uranium-235, and that it emits an electron when it is forced to decay, this is potassium-40, which is a, a small fraction of 1% of overall natural potassium. This can feed the exotic vacuum objects, these itonic clusters, as they form. And if you want to understand where I'm going to go and why potassium is so important, why I came to the conclusion that it is so valuable in Lena systems, it is in this book, Space Earth Human, which I recommend you go out and get it because you will understand what I talk about when you have read that book. And there is a particular part in here that I'm not even sure Alexander Parkamov understands, but definitely... I was not surprised when I had presented at ICCF22 and said that 
Potassium is so important in lender systems for this specific reason of this forced decay of it. And when I came back from ICCF 22, I finalized the proofreading and layout of this book. And I found out that, <laughs> lo and behold, he says that in this book, that potassium 40 is the fuel of the future. Okay, so I, in my view, will explain exactly why that is in the coming weeks and months. Anyway, so he's using potassium carbonate here. I also talked about potassium carbonate, I think it was, in the Mizuno singularity where he was using tungsten and it blew up in his lab and injured some people and so on. But there's a very critical reason why this occurs in these very high power discharges in very small time frames. But discharges were made between the electrodes under continuous DC or pulsed AC modes. A key point of underwater spark discharge was to make a pinch effect worked well on the surface of the thin wire electrodes. The current voltage curve showed a strong nonlinearity having three typical regions. In the highest voltage region, the pinch effect worked well so that the current was strongly suppressed. Tiny sparks and weak lightning appeared on the surfaces of the cathode and the anode, respectively. The tiny sparks were found to be consisted of many itonic clusters, which were often ball clusters. Weak lightning were caused by breakup of ring clusters on the anode. And then here he goes, acceleration methods for I of itonic clusters. Here are two different methods of obtaining accelerated itonic clusters, where, uh, and they will be proposed. Acceleration of itonic clusters... Since itonic clusters were sufficiently stable and negatively charged, it would be not difficult to accelerate them by a linear accelerator. A system of linear accelerator would be consisting of three main parts, source of itonic clusters, pre-acceleration, and acceleration by the linac. In the second part, itonic clusters could be collected or somewhat accelerated by a static electric field for the separation with different ratio of charge to mass. Itonization of accelerated proton beam. An alternative generation method of accelerated itonic clusters would be itonization of accelerated protons. Figure 1 shows a conceptual view of acceleration of itonic clusters. First of all, a beam of protons with high energy should be provided by LINAC. Many electrons could be charged to the proton beam harmonically. Then, since the protons should be bunched in a narrow space, they could be effectively itonized with many electrons. After that, the selection could be made for obtaining clusters with the same charge to mass ratio. So essentially here, it's got a LINAC like uh, 1932. Cockcroft and Walton used to do the first fusion and fission experiment when they fired protons uh, in a linear accelerator into 7 lithium. That fused to beryllium-8 and fissioned to 2,4 helium. So that proved both fusion and fission, and they won the shade, the Nobel Prize for that, and proved that these nuclear reactions could be technologically produced. Anyway, so discussion. The accelerated beam of itonic clusters would open new physics as well as industrial applications in future. For example, a bombardment between tiny black holes would be possible in the laboratory. We would obtain valuable information about that which could contribute to our understanding of the universe. And if you get two black holes and they come together, they spiral around each other, often before they destroy each other, and this creates high-frequency gravitational waves. So this is the kind of thing that you can do with this technology, and it's got a little diagram down here. So you've got your accelerated uh, bunched protons here, then you've got your bunched electrons coming in, and supposedly this will make itonization, and you will get your spheres or your toroids being produced. Anyway, I just wanted to talk about Bogdanovich, and in 2019 they had a paper here published, and it was peer-reviewed in plasma and technical physics here, and they were doing a uh, electrical discharge in water onto a metal plate, and they found that they created these toroids here, which you can see, and this is very interesting because this toroid in this gaseous environment, this is made of a sort of supposedly gaseous structure, but you've got a plasma discharge behind it, and it's completely masking that. So this is something that's not solid, but was able to stop all light transferring through that. And that tells you something. You've got a plasmoid here on the metal surface here. You've got plasmoids coming down here and so forth. But here's the very interesting thing. They saw toroids moving around two days after the experiment had finished. And you can see it's kind of spinning around. It creates, a, you know, an extreme, it creates a paisley type shape, but it's got this little tail on it. And it's supposedly transmuting material. And they observed these, as I say, two days later, 
I have had some people come back to me and say they've observed these a couple of months later. Anyway, these things can cluster together into these superstructures, which then become more spherical objects, and they have things that move around within them, and the whole thing can move. And for me, this is closer to being an itonic spherical cluster rather than an individual toroid. And so between these two structures and their aggregates, you can get everything that you observe in Lena and all of the different things that they can do from transmutation to nucleus regeneration to stabilization of radioactive isotopes and so forth. And I actually did a blog, and I will link to this also, in a couple of years or a year before this, where someone identified that in a normal automotive spark discharge with water sprayed on it, and it was a much higher energy in a small time frame discharge by using one of these, I think, microwave diode hacks on the coil, they were able to produce something that looked like this. So I think that was actually the first one that was observed. But apparently they have videos of these things moving around. So this is, for me, how Lena works. I think that a lot of time has been wasted by not looking at the work of Takaaki Matsumoto. And I think that anyone who is serious in this field should look at the work of the Russians, the Bogdanovich team, the Shishkin team, the work of Takaaki Matsumoto, the work of the Russian Alexander Parkamov and his team. And these people, a lot of them were replicating what Shoulders had established. And Shoulders looked at the work of John Hutchison from 1979 and got involved in, in, in around 1981, 1982. And he went back to the work of Bostick from 1949 onwards, who, to my mind, was working back to Tesla. Now you have a connection between Tesla and the work of John Hutchison. So you have a situation where people in Russia are giving credit to Takeaki Matsumoto and Ken Shoulders. And I think that if you are serious about learned genuinely reactions, you should be paying attention and reading the works and internalizing the works of Takaaki Matsumoto and Ken Shoulders. And I look forward in this coming year to settling, from my view, the core parts of this science so that we can start generating working technologies that give benefit to the public at large. Thank you very much, and I look forward to seeing you in the next video.